Well, I gotta begin with a bit of a confession here this evening. I am, um, I am by nature a little bit more of a project starter than I am a project finisher. Um, my sort of tendency is I can, get, I can get excited about taking on a project, I can get excited about initiating something, but inevitably for me, there comes a point in the process where I sort of like lose interest. If this is a, if this is a project at, at home, if this is something we got going on there, it's almost always the point in time that requires sanding something. Like I can get up to a point, I'm excited about um, the whole thing, and then as soon as something needs sanded, um, I'm out altogether. I just hate it for whatever reason. In my laundry room right now, there's a wall that, that needed to be repaired. Everything's been done. Um, drywall is, is up, the plumbing, the electrical, everything. It's been two years sitting there waited to be sanded. Um, I, have, I have issues. Um, you can ask my wife. I can tell some of you are able to relate to that, by the way, as well, because I could see the less than subtle nudges that some of you just got from supportive spouses. So um, I'm not the only one that, that this is true of. And I bring all of this up because we're kind of coming to this sort of critical point in, in the book of, of Nehemiah. The project that we've been learning about is, is at a really important stage. Completion is, is now within sight, and, and as this is happening, sort of the distractions that, that surrounded Nehemiah are beginning to, to intensify a bit. Um, I believe as, as we look here at, at Nehemiah 6, um, that Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem were at a point where it would have been very easy to sort of settle for close enough. Um, this will work. Right? This is going to work. Um, this, is, this is good enough. It's functional. Can you relate to that a little bit? I think Nehemiah and the people in Jerusalem were sort of at this point in the project. Um, and, and I can understand that. I get that. As, as before we look at, at Nehemiah 6, and I want to take a few moments just to kind of review where we've been up to this point and, and hit a couple of the highlights. And a couple of things have stood out to me as, as we've been working our way through the book of Nehemiah together. Um, and that first, is Nehemiah was heartbroken when he learned about the devastation in Jerusalem. This, this sort of begins with this sort of call to action that Nehemiah experiences. He knows that that the condition that Jerusalem is in is not what God has intended. And it breaks his heart. This moves him to, to take action. It's interesting when you, again, review the story that Nehemiah's first step, his first action was just prayer, intense, extended times of prayer. Where his heart is broken, he's called to action, and that action begins by falling to his knees and seeking God's provision, his wisdom, his insight. Nehemiah is heartbroken. The second thing that has stood out to me, kind of just as a highlight here, is that Nehemiah recognized that he had two sort of important qualifications that made him the right guy for the job. The first is that he was in a position of influence, and the second was that he had a, um, a position that gave him opportunity. His position as, as cupbearer to the king has uniquely, uniquely qualified him to take on the act of restoring Jerusalem. And what's interesting to me is when we think about this is that God does the very same to us. As, unless you and I were to, to live in a complete vacuum, God has put us somewhere. He's placed us in positions of influence and opportunity. It might be in the context of our jobs in the context of our families, in the context of our church, um, in our neighborhoods, wherever, every single one of us has been put in a position where we have influence and opportunity. And the question then becomes, what am I doing with that? Am I using that? Thirdly, then we saw that Nehemiah was strategic. Nehemiah is strategic about how he approaches this. Nehemiah is more than a person with just good intentions. He goes about the business that God has called him to. He has a plan, and he strategically goes about implementing it. He does all the work that's required to ultimately respond now to the call that God has placed in his life. Fourthly, then, we see that Nehemiah has faced opposition. On the one hand, 
The, the opposition has been external. There are people on the outside who see the work that's happening in Jerusalem, and they view it as a threat to their own power and position. And so they seek to stop Nehemiah and, and what it is that's happening in Jerusalem. Second, though, there's, there's internal opposition. Nehemiah faces conflict within the people that needs to be resolved. And as we think about this, I believe that it's oftentimes that that internal conflict that we experience that, that poses the greatest risk to sidetracking us from God's calling in our lives. In my experience, I don't know if that's true universally, but in my experience, it's that internal conflict, that internal threat that oftentimes poses the greatest risk. These are, are, are just a couple of the highlights that we've hit on up to this point but I mention all of this not only for the sake of, of review together, but also to recognize that Nehemiah's experience is very much a picture of the way God continues to work in our lives and in this, his church. Despite the nearly 2,500 years that separate Nehemiah and our current time, and the innumerable amount of, of cultural or social or political or economic differences, the example of what God seeks to do in and through Nehemiah is directly and I think powerfully related to the work that he calls you and I to do here, now, in this place, in the lives that we have. He does it both individually and he does it corporately together for us as the church. I think this is why the experience of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is so relevant right now as we read this because he continues to play this out in, the, in our own hearts, in our own lives. So we're going to pick up the story here in Nehemiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to read here. We're going to start with the first four verses and just kind of make our way through the chapter. This is verse 1. It says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up at that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together in Hakfarim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. Let's pause there for a second. Because as we work our way through these verses, there's a few observations that stand out to me. And the first thing that, that emerges as we look at these verses is that, that Nehemiah was facing the threat of distraction. He's facing the threat of, of distraction. Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem have already attempted now to deter Nehemiah's efforts to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem with the direct approach. As we already mentioned in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, these same people are attacking the people of Jerusalem with swords and spears, but now they would seek to stop the work in a much more subversive and indirect way. What they ultimately failed to accomplish with traditional weapons, they would now attempt with the tasks of lies and, and deceit and, and blackmail. If they could distract Nehemiah, if they could call his eyes off of what God had called him to, if they could pull him away from the task at hand in the safety of the wall, then Nehemiah here would be vulnerable and Jerusalem could be defeated. I, uh, I mentioned that um, I had the privilege again this summer of being with our students on some of the short-term missions trips. And um, for years, we've been going down to, to Ecuador. I've told stories about that before, but um, over the last several years, Rick Borman, who's one of our church-supported missionaries and the son of the Bormans that were some of the original missionaries sent out of FBCG in Ecuador, um, grew up down there. And he, he has joined our team several times to help um, lead the students and, and their time down there. And um, this year, as, as we were kind of going down to the jungle for some of the experience down there, we do baptisms down there, Rick shared a story with the students, and he said, this is the time I was the most afraid in my life, um, which is always a good sort of intro to a story. Um, and so all the students kind of ears perked up, and he began to share a story about a time when 
he and his brother had, had canoed into the deep, deep portions of the jungle to go hunting. Um, he had a very different childhood than I had. You know, I was like, I rode my bike to the library. Um, <laughs> he canoed into the deep, deep portions of the jungle to, to go hunting beyond. Um, he said what stood out to him is he had gone be, um, about three hours beyond the, the last house. Um, so there's no human contact around him. So him and his brother are out um, hunting all day long and they would use a jungle call, they called it, to, to locate each other. Because as, as one of them was chasing whatever it is, monkeys that they were hunting, um, they, they would find each other by shouting back and forth this jungle call to each other. And, and um, so in the evening, they had kind of set up a tent. They were going to be there for, for a couple days. And it gets dark in the jungle at about 6.30. Um, and it is, it is dark, pitch black. Um, and, and so they had kind of settled down for the evening and were kind of resting up. Um, and, and all of a sudden, sort of their dogs, their, they had some dogs that they had taken with them, began to stir. And out in the, in the darkness, they heard their jungle call. And they sort of turned and, and looked at each other and said, what, what like there isn't human um, activity within days of, of where they're at, at least hours. Um, and all of a sudden, the dogs sort of get silent and kind of slink under the beds. They, they grab their, their guns or their weapons or whatever they've got, blow dart, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, and they sort of settle in and, and, and kind of hear something rustle by them and, and, and kind of go behind the tent. And all of a sudden, the dogs start getting braver again. And they're like, what was going on? Um, so eventually they return and they go back to the Kofan Indians where they, they lived and worked and did missionary work. And, and they began to share this story. And, and some of the um, Kofan tribesmen said, oh, that was a jaguar. A jaguar can learn the call of its prey and mimic it in order to draw it out and bring it to a place of vulnerability. I still, like, my hair stands up on the back. I told the students when we were in the jungle, I was like, look, if you guys are at night, you hear somebody be like, guys, come over here. Don't go. It's a jaguar. Um, but it, but it, it stands, as I, as I remember that story and I was reading this context, I was like, what a perfect picture of what is happening here. Because Nehemiah is facing this threat, and they are calling out, and there's just every attempt is to distract him from what is at hand, to draw him away from the place of safety where he becomes vulnerable. And his enemies are saying, look, it didn't work with the direct approach. Let's, let's come at this from another way. Um, Nehemiah doesn't fall for it. The first four attempts here, they're very straightforward, Right? So Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together at Hekfarim. If we can just get him to focus on something other than the wall. In this case here, it becomes very evident to Nehemiah right away that, that this, their intentions are to harm him. I think sometimes, however, for you and I, the potential for harm is slightly less obvious. We live in a world of, of constant opportunities. There are clubs for our kids, new ventures at work, opportunities for advancement, places to connect. Most, if not all of these, are, are good things. They are beneficial things. But then the question that we have to ask ourselves is, have they distracted us from the thing? Have they pulled us away from the thing that God has has told us to be about? Have I lost sight of that which is primary in the pursuit of that which is secondary? Nehemiah sees these invitations for what they are, a distraction from what God has called him to be about, and he stays firmly placed on the wall. When this fails, then we pick this up in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 5. They don't give up. It says, in the same way when Sanballat for the fifth time uh, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it is written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says, says it, that you and the Jews tend to rebel. That's why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. 
Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, Sanballat essentially tells Nehemiah, by the way, in a very public fashion, people are, are talking. People are saying that, that um, Jerusalem intends to, to rebel. People are saying that you are going to set yourself up as king. As a matter of fact, you've even put prophets out there to proclaim your rise. Once again, though, um, Nehemiah is undeterred. I, I, I struggle here. Because I know in and of myself, I am a people pleaser. I want people to, to like me. I want to address sort of every misunderstanding or, or criticism. If I had been Nehemiah, my fear is that this is what it would have taken to pull me off of the wall. But again here, Nehemiah sees right through the veiled attempt at concern. And he turns his eyes back to the task that God has for him. And he stays firmly planted on the wall. Again, they don't give up. Back in chapter 6, we pick it up in verses is 10 and through 13. Their third attempt. It says, Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah and the son of Deliah, at the, uh, the son of Matabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, and what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way in sin. And so they could give me a bad, a bad name in order to, to taunt me. Now here, uh, when these previous attempts have not worked, they, they attempt to draw Nehemiah out with the promise of, of safety. There's this, this prophet or this priest named um, Shemahai who approaches Nehemiah to tell him, he says, take refuge in the temple because your life is in danger. When all else has failed now to pull Nehemiah from the work that God has placed in front of him, Tobiah and Sanballat attempt to play on Nehemiah's fears to distract him with the promise of safety. I, I'm not sure that I can say this definitively, but in my own experience, one of the greatest limitations in the life of the modern day church, one of the things that I think that holds me back, us back the most, is, is the fear that we believe comes with a life sold out to God and, and the false belief of safety that is available to us in compromise. I think that's what they're offering Nehemiah. I think that's what they're laying out in front of him. We believe that there's safety off the wall, but in the midst of all of these potential distractions now, Nehemiah's attentions remain focused on the task that God has called him to and to the one who has called him. It is in the midst of the threat of these distractions then that we also can see and discover what Nehemiah uses in his defense. See, because the question that emerges for me as I, example, uh, as I examine the example of Nehemiah is, is simply how. How did he, as a leader, um, stay focused? How did he, through all the attempts to take him away from what God had called him to, what he had placed in his life, how did he stay focused? How did he stay on the wall? How did he remain focused on the job that he had at hand um, when there were so many distractions that seemed to be calling for his attention? How, as a leader, did he discern what, uh, discern what would demand his attention and what it is that he would ignore? See, I think there's two vital qualities that emerge in the life of Nehemiah that demonstrate um, how he was able to defend himself against these distractions and to lead so effectively. Look back again at verse 3. I love this verse. When he replies to the first sort of threat, and he says, I sent a message to them saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop and I leave and come down to you? 
See, the first thing that stands out to me there is that Nehemiah was a man of purpose. He was a man of purpose. Perhaps this is obvious to you, but, but I think it's important to mention. Nehemiah here understood what it was that God was asking of him. And he maintained this laser-like focus um, on, on the purpose before him. In the life of the church, what we are about together as a community, this is the gospel. This is our purpose, our calling, our singular focus. In order for us to be affection, uh, effective, our vision needs to be focused solely on the cross. This doesn't mean that everything that we do in the life of the church becomes an evangelistic meeting, but rather that every program, every event, every small group, youth group, children's ministry gather is seen as an opportunity to advance the gospel. This is what God has called us to, this understanding of, of our purpose. The call in the life of the church is clear. We are to be about the gospel. And the moment that we lose sight of that, we effectively step off the wall. Not only, though, was Nehemiah a man of purpose, we also discover that he was a man of truth. What stands out to me about Nehemiah is his commitment to an awareness of the truth. I think this is seen most clearly in that third attempt to distract him. Where there's this prophecy that comes and says, let's hide in the temple, let's pull away, let's withdraw. And Nehemiah is able to, to see, that, see through that because he knows God's word. And he knows that it's a violation not only of his role as a leader, but to use God's temple as a hideout instead of a place of worship was, was sacrilegious. Nehemiah sees right through this, this prophecy for what it is because he understood and was committed to the truth. Verse 12 says, And I understood and saw that God had not sent them because he knew the truth. It is Nehemiah's unwavering commitment to his purpose and to the truth that ultimately becomes his defense against the distractions of his enemy. Then lastly, though, we see here the results. Nehemiah chapter 6. Let's pick it up in verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. When all the enemies heard of it and all the nations around were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. This work had been accomplished with the help of our God. I love these verses because Nehemiah now sees what it is that he had hoped for. The vision that he had has now been realized. The wall is complete. From the time that Nehemiah spoke to the king to the completion of the wall was less than six months. The wall that laid in ruins for a century and a half has now been rebuilt in a matter of 52 days. And I love this ultimate conclusion. It says in verse 16, For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. You see, the people looked at what had happened in Jerusalem. They saw the wall rebuilt, and they said, God did that. God did that. I think this stands as a model for us as the church. That is what I want to be said of, of me. I want to live the sort of life that people look at and say, God did that. He did that. I want to be the sort of father that doesn't just raise good kids. I want to be the sort of father that brings up three daughters that are unwaveringly committed to the business of the kingdom of God, who are people that are committed in both their purpose and in truth. And I understand I don't control, ultimately, the women that my three daughters will become. I get that. But I have influence and I have opportunity, just like Nehemiah. I want to see them pursue their Savior with passion and for people to see it happen and say, Sterling didn't do that. God, God did that. That was God. I want to be the sort of youth pastor that models genuine faith and the sort of gratitude that can only be produced in a life that's been saved by grace. I don't want to pretend to be perfect, but I want to say like, Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. I want students to be able to look at my life and my marriage and my family and say, God did that. 
God did that. I want to be a pastor who lives in genuine community, who isn't afraid to, to be real, who experiences authentic relationships and advances the gospel. I want to be the sort of leader when there is no doubt that, that when God has worked, that it's so far beyond my capacity, my ability, my giftedness, or anything that I bring to the table, that when God has worked, when God has moved, the community looks and says, God did that. I want to be a part of a church where we are known, where people who are hurting come in to receive, to receive healing, where the gospel drives everything, where the suffering are made whole and the sinners don't feel the need to pretend to be saints. I want God to use us in such powerful and mighty ways that the community that surrounds us here in the Tri-Cities and in Kane County sees what's happening right here in this building, down the street. They look at us, the activity that God is about, and they say, God did that. You see, I think that's the example that we find in Nehemiah. He dreamed something beyond what he could accomplish in and of himself. And the world, even his enemies, they looked at them and said, God, God did that. That's my prayer. That's my desire for my life, for our church, um, for what it is that's in front of us. 52 days, God completed the building of the wall. And the people looked around and said, God, God did that. May the same be true of us. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I just thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, and I pray that, that like Nehemiah, Lord, as we've come to the completion of this wall, that you would do such a work here, Lord, that you would do such a work in me, Lord, that you would do such a work in us corporately, that it would be clear to all that you did that. Lord, meet us challenge us. Let us follow the example of Nehemiah and keep our eyes fixed on the cross, fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.